All right, let's get started. This is Lecture 7 in Engineering 216. It's pre-recorded. Um, just a little bit of heads up, uh, the attendance grades are up to date. Uh, I do. I know I still have some uh, emails and whatnot to sift through to uh, uh, for some of the excused absences that we've had with uh, the weather. Uh, I accounted for all that again in the attendance, but uh, I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be periodically, you know, uh, trying to dig through the email hole here uh, through the next little bit. Uh, so just a uh, uh, give, uh, be patient on that. Um, like I said, I'm not going to uh, hold anybody's attendance grades uh, uh, to them because of you know being snowed in or whatnot. Um, <clears throat> this is going to go live uh, on Tuesday. So by then, uh, uh, homework 1.3 will be graded. Uh, homework 2.1 uh, is probably still going to be graded. It might be done. I'm, I'm not sure. But in any case, by the time this video goes live, the solution will be posted. Uh, homework 2.2 is going to be due at the time that this video goes live and then 2.3 will be assigned. So we'll just keep on with the same uh, pattern that we've been um, uh, that we've been engaging in. Uh, what we're going to do today is uh, finish up our discussion on axially loaded members by talking about thermal stresses and strains. This is what happens when a member uh, heats up or, uh, or, or cools down. It's obviously going to change in volume, which means we're going to get strains, deformations, um, etc. First off, I just want to make sure that we're all clear on the um, the, the basics. Hold on, I need to advance the correct slide. Uh, there we go. All right, so um, I want to make sure that everybody's clear on the basics and that we're good on uh, mechanical stresses and strains So uh, and mechanical deformation. So if I take a, a member and I apply an axial load, it uh, uh, responds by deforming uh, along x axis uh, and if everything's constant then the deformation is PL over EA the applied load times the member length divided by the elastic modulus times the cross-sectional area um, and that works if everything's constant if it's variable uh, or and, and specifically what I mean by if it's variable I'm talking about either a, um, a variable load or a variable area uh, then we need to integrate in order to determine the uh, the elongation and I think I've mentioned this before, I guess technically we could have a variable E value, but that's in, pra uh, in practical terms, that's incredibly rare that that would really happen. Um, I mean, it's not as if a, a member is going to start as steel on one end and then turn into aluminum. Usually, uh, at least for most applications, you can assume those material properties to be constant. Um, but the problem, at least with the problem with what we're going to be talking about today is that this formula is only enough to handle mechanical stresses and strains, taking a member and actually physically applying a load to it. Um, but it should stand to reason that if you take a member and change its thermal conditions, you either heat it up or you cool it down, it's going to deform. And so we need to talk about that um, in this, uh, um, uh, in this uh, uh, context. So. Temperature changes do affect the geometry. You know, when objects heat up, they expand. When they cool down, they contract. I mean, um, this is something I think everybody uh, uh, in the class is probably already familiar with. Um, but I want to make sure that we're thinking about this in terms of the context of mechanics and materials, of solid mechanics, of, of engineering systems being subjected to forces and whatnot. Um, so for axial members, we express this as a function of the change in temperature and a coefficient of thermal expansion. Uh, and, and what that does is uh, uh, yield the axial strain due to the temperature change. So alpha is a material parameter that's different for each material. And the idea is that um, alpha will tell you how much strain you get per degree change in temperature. So if I have uh, a member that starts at 20 degrees Celsius and it goes to 80 degrees Celsius, so that's a change in temperature of 60 degrees Celsius. Um, alpha will tell me, tell me how much strain I get per change in degrees Celsius. So take alpha, multiply it by 60, and boom, there's the strain. Uh, and Appendix I in the textbook lists alpha values for various materials. And we've already um, uh, shown some alpha values before for, um, uh, or, not, or we've already shown Appendix I before for um, like E and yield stresses and so on and so forth. And so you can find similar uh, uh, data for alpha values uh, as well for various materials. Most of the problems that we're going to be doing in here, um, alpha will be given to you at the beginning. But if you don't have it, it they're, they're easy lookups and whatnot. Um, one of the things that you have to um, understand, and this is probably the one thing that is um, uh, that is different for um, thermal loads as opposed to mechanical loads, is what happens with stress. Now, 
To be clear, um, you know, if I go back to the previous slide, the fundamental definition or the fundamental way that we handle thermal effects is we take alpha times delta T to yield a strain. Okay, so for example, if we know, uh, for example, that strain is the change in length over the original length, then we can say that the uh, the, uh, the deformation, if you will, is strain times length. Well, we can do the same thing right here, and we can say, well, the elongation due to thermal loads is alpha, or sorry, um, I wrote, um, I wrote epsilon again. Yeah. So we could easily say alpha times delta T times L, right, to get the, the thermal elongation. Uh, and that, that's pretty straight, straightforward. And it's tempting to say, well, if I know thermal strain, well, I can compute thermal stress by just multiplying it by E. And, and to be clear, that, that formula does work, but what um, what is different about thermal stresses and strains, and what is probably one of the most important components of this lecture is this statement right here. And that is that thermal stress only occurs if there's some degree of restraint. So what I mean by that is imagine that you have an element and you heat it up. Okay, I propose is that it, it will elongate. It will generate deformation. But it won't generate any stress if the member is allowed to freely elongate. Um, it will generate strain. It will generate deformation. It will not generate stress. The only time that you get stress is when there is some degree of restraint. Um, and that'll become clear in the uh, couple of examples that we're going to do here in a little bit. Um, the other thing that's worth mentioning is that these formulas assume that the, the, um, the change in temperature is constant. And it is very possible that the change in temperature varies as a function of x. So for example, if you have a member, um, you might have a scenario where one side of the member is getting hotter than the other side. So the change in temperature is variable along the length. And if that's the case, you just have to integrate like you would before. A lot of times we'll deal with, with linear changes in temperature and whatnot. It's not very difficult. It's just you, know, you have to be aware uh, of how to handle that. we got a couple examples here we're going to do um, that go through that. Okay, so let me get my ink cup here. And let's look at our two examples that we're going to do. So this is going to be an example with thermal restraint. So we have a member that it's fixed between two walls um, and we're going to drop the temperature. So it's going to want to change uh, in volume, but the walls are going to prevent that from happening. So the walls are resisting that, um, that volumetric change and they're doing so by applying a mechanical load. They, they are, you know, the member is wanting to change in, in volume and the walls are preventing that from happening. So they're fixing the element in place. And so that's sort of where you get the, the thermal stresses and strains. It's not the, the, or the thermal stresses, if you will. It's not the, um, the, um, it's not the thermal load by itself. It's the thermal load and it's resistance by the walls, okay? So we're going to uh, change the temperature 70 degrees and we're going to see what happens to the, uh, to, the, to, to the member. Now we have the bar length, the cross-sectional area, we've got all the data. So this is actually going to be a pretty quick problem. This problem here is going to take a little bit longer because we have a brass bar that's subjected to an axial load at the tip. We have uh, its E value, its bar, length, uh, its bar length, that's its original bar length. We have its yield stress, alpha, bar diameter. And we do have, in addition to the axial load, we have a uh, bar that's heated its, uh, along its length. It's found to vary linearly from uh, 50 degrees Fahrenheit at the fixed end to 150 uh, degrees Fahrenheit at the loaded end. And so we're going to determine the magnitude of P uh, if the allowable elongation of the rod uh, is 0 0.08 inches. And then we'll also see whether or not the rod is behaving elastically. So it'll be a nice, it's a little bit of a longer example, but it's nice that it will um, close the loop, if you will, on everything that we're doing. Okay, so let's go ahead and pull up the um, the notebook here. Okay, and let's start off with this first problem. Okay, so I think you're going to find is, is pretty straightforward. So we have a steel bar that is secured between two walls, and we have a bar length of 100 inches, a cross-sectional area of 2 inches, a modulus of elasticity of 30 times 10 to the 6 PSI, uh, and an alpha value of um, uh, 6.5 times 10 to the negative 6. And then the units are degrees Fahrenheit to the negative 1. The way of thinking of that is 1 per degree Fahrenheit. Because again, this is telling you the strain 
per chain, uh, degree change in temperature. Remember, strain is unitless. That's why it's one over degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so it, what I'm talking about there is the units. Um, so if the load uh, uh, on the rod is zero at 70 degrees, compute the stress when the temperature drops to zero degrees. Okay, so let's, let's write down what's going on here. Let's see if we can summarize some things. So we have So we know that L is 100 inches. We know that E is 30 times 10 to the 6 PSI. We know that the area is 2 inches squared. Alpha, I just draw that like a little, little fish or whatnot, uh, is 6.5 times 10 to the negative 6 1 over degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and again, alpha is is usually a very small number. So that's that's uh, that's very typical. And delta T, in this case, the change in temperature. So let's let's read the problem again. If the load on the rod is zero uh, at 70 degrees Fahrenheit, compute the stress when the temperature drops to zero degrees Fahrenheit. So technically we have a negative 70 degrees Fahrenheit uh, situation. Now, the way that we're going to do this problem is, is very akin to the very last example that we did. So what we're going to do is we're going to assume one wall is free. So, in, so what we're going to do is we're going to assume that the rod looks like this. Okay. So instead of this support over here on the right, we're going to remove that support. And we're going to apply this thermal condition. So it started at 70 degrees and the temperature drops to zero degrees. So if we're dropping the temperature, what's going to happen uh, is this member is going to shrink some. Okay, it is going to uh, it is going to reduce in length, and it's going to reduce in length by some delta. In this case, delta T, the delta that we get as a function of the thermal displacement. So this is what the bar looks like before. Here's what the bar is going to look like um, after the thermal load is applied. It's going to shrink. Okay, so if that's the case, then um, how much is that deformation? Well, uh, if strain is alpha times delta t, then delta is alpha delta t l. Just change in length over the original length, multiply by the original length. So this is. 6.5 times 10 to the negative 6, not 16, that's a typo. And then negative 70 degrees Fahrenheit. The negative doesn't really matter here. Uh, you know, I'm just using the negative to indicate that the element is getting shorter, not longer, but the negative value doesn't really matter very much as long as you understand the context. And then 100 inches. Okay. So if you plug and chug all that, you're going to get 0 0.0455 inches. Okay. Now, um, in terms of units, you know this should be pretty easy to follow because um, you know you have one per degree Fahrenheit and then degree Fahrenheit that cancels and it leaves your element in inches. So if this uh, element was allowed to deform, uh, it is going to shrink by a, a, a distance of 0 0.0455 inches. But the facts are the this is the the, the real problem. The problem is the, the 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 bar is fixed between the two walls. So I propose that if the temperature drops and the member wants to shrink 0 0.455 inches, then the walls are preventing that. So the walls are actually pulling it 0. Point, uh, with uh, pulling it such that the mechanical elongation would equal 0 0.455 inches. So mechanically. This must equal must equal that. In other words, um, this deformation must equal PL over EA, and P in this case is the wall reaction. How much the wall is applying a, a tensile force to keep the uh, uh, the elongation uh, net zero. So in this case, delta is zero point zero four five five inches. L is 100 inches, 
E is 30 times 10 to the 6 PSI. I know I'm rewriting a lot of this. A is 2 square inches. So what do we not know in this formula? We don't know P, right? So therefore, P is going to be, and what do we, how do we figure that out? Well, we just multiply both sides by, uh, in this case, we're going to multiply both sides by EA over L. Here, let me move this over a little bit. So multiply both sides by EA over L. The EA over L's cancel, and so on the uh, on the right end, so we're left with EA over L times delta, which is just a big old fraction. Delta is 0.0455 inches over 100 inches. And so this, when you plug and chug, you get something like 27,300 pounds. So that's how much force the wall has to apply to keep the, um, the, um, the bar fixed uh, with a, a net zero deformation. So um, if we wanted, we could have uh, probably just said, well, sigma is P over A and just, you know, uh, dispensed with the A uh, in that, that uh, previous computation. But I think it's kind of nice to see the, um, the force and then now the resulting stress. So 27,300 pounds over two square inches. And that's it. So hopefully, I think this is a like I said, this is a pretty short problem, but I think it um, it makes sense. One of the things that I, I think is worth um, conceptualizing before we move on to the next problem is what type of force is this bar seeing? Is it seeing compression or is it seeing tension? And if you think about it, this bar is experiencing a tensile load. So the temperature is dropping. The bar wants to shrink. The walls are preventing that. So the walls are having to actually pull it back apart so the bar on the flip end on the flip side if we were heating the bar up i mean the the um, the analogy i could think of is imagine you had two walls and you had a balloon right in the middle of the wall and you heated up the balloon the balloon's wanting to expand and the walls are preventing that so the walls are pushing uh are, are pushing back and so if you were increasing the temperature you'd get compression you're going to get tension, uh, tensile uh, forces uh, in your element. So uh, hopefully that, uh, I think that probably uh, is pretty straightforward. Um, let's go to the next example. This one is a little bit longer. It's not harder. Uh, I think there's just a little bit more going on. Um, and uh, there's just a little bit more to, uh, to take into account. Um, the most... Um, I guess, important thing to, to recognize for this problem uh, is the following. So we have a bar here that is subjected to an axial load at the tip and then it is also subjected to um, a, a, a variable temperature load. So um, if I want to determine the total elongation for this bar, um, it is going to be the delta from the mechanical effects plus the delta from the thermal effects. And so that right there, I think is probably the most important thing to keep in mind, um, is that what we're gonna do for, for this is we're gonna try and handle these separately, which is completely fine. You can do this just about you know in, in any other problem. The idea is that since the mechanical uh, effects and the thermal effects are independent of one another, let's handle each of those separately to determine elongations uh, and, and, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Now, what we're ultimately going to do uh, is determine the magnitude of P if the allowable elongation of the rod, including the temperature effect, is 0 0.08 inches. Um, so what that means is um, we're going to set delta here on the top equation equal to 0 0.08 inches. We're going to have a mechanical deformation and a thermal deformation, and we're going to solve for P. Okay, That's basically what we're going to do here in this problem. So let's, let's sort of treat this like we did the last problem. Let's see if we can... Um, Develop some parameters, take each of these deformations one at a time, uh, and then uh, just chug through it. Now, 
The other thing that's worth mentioning is that we're going to do the thermal elongation first. Um, for, for one, this is the one that I think is maybe a little bit more complicated. It requires some calculus. The other thing is that we're able, we're going to able, be able to find a value for the thermal displacement because we already know what's going on here. We have all the bar properties. We know the, the variable temperature, so we can find that elongation. We need to determine P such that the maximum elongation uh, is this. So if we look at our upper expression, we're going to set uh, 0.08 equal to delta mechanical plus delta thermal. We can go ahead and solve for delta thermal now. So let's do that first. Okay. But in the meantime, let's write down some of our parameters. Okay. So for this problem, we know we're dealing with brass. We know we're dealing with a length of 60 inches. Now, one of the things I want to want to write here with this uh, problem, because I think that this is um, maybe a little bit of a bookkeeping issue that, that you want to make sure that you're paying attention to. So read what the problem statement says. The problem statement says the bar length undeformed at 50 degrees Fahrenheit is 60 inches. So I'm going to say at 50 degrees Fahrenheit because that's going to be important to make sure that we're uh, describing our delta T function correctly because we're really going to want to read this and make sure that we understand how we develop that uh, that formula. Okay, now we're given a yield stress of 15,000 PSI. Um, we're not going to use that until the very, very, very end for this problem, uh, but we do need to make sure that we have it. Okay, we've got alpha. Um, we know our delta allowable now um, in terms of the bar we know that the diameter of the bar is because we know here yeah it's a bar diameter of 0 0.5 inches so therefore the area is pi over 4d squared, which uh, if you chug that out, you get 0 0.196 square inches. So let's just go ahead and make sure we have that. And ultimately, okay, so we're going to deal with thermal elongation first. Okay. So let's read this sentence right here. In addition to P, the bar is heated along its length and the temperature is found to vary linearly from 50 degrees at the fixed end to 150 degrees at the loaded end. So here's what I'm going to write. I'm going to write at X equals zero, the temperature is 50 degrees Fahrenheit and at X equals L, the temperature is 150 degrees Fahrenheit. But, okay, now let's let's make sure that we're paying attention here. This is the temperature. Okay, let's read the sentence again. The bar is heated along its length and the temperature is found to vary linearly from 50 degrees at the fixed end to 150 degrees at the loaded end. But I'm not so sh uh, much interested in writing a function for temperature. I am interested in writing a function for the change in temperature. Because that's what we need. I don't really care what the temperature is. I care what the temperature changed to be. So, for example, if I have a problem and the temperature is 80 degrees and I, and I ask, well, what are the effects when the temperature is 90 degrees? Um, so the temperature was initially 80 degrees and it becomes 90 degrees. My delta T is not 90. My delta T is 10, right? Because it's a, the difference between what my temperature was to what my temperature is. So I want to make sure that we're paying attention to this value right here, the length. The length is 60 degrees, the undeformed length at a temperature of 50 degrees. So that's our baseline. That's the, the beginning of the problem, if you will. That's what the temperature was. So if we look at the end when it says, um, if we look at the, the end conditions, the temperature is found to vary linearly from 50 degrees at the fixed end to 150 degrees at the loaded end. The delta T at the fixed end is zero, right? Because it started out at 50 degrees, 
and it ended at 50 degrees. So the, the fixed end didn't change in temperature at all. The free end, however, changed to 100 degrees. It was 50, now it's 150. Again, we're not talking about temperature, we're talking about change in temperature. So <clears throat> what we're gonna do is we're gonna write a slope function So we'll call this delta T1, delta T2. And so delta T1 is zero, so this is delta T2 over L, right? So you should see what I'm doing here. So this is just the point slope formula. The intercept, so here, let's, let's write it like this. So this is the slope. The intercept is delta t1, which in this case is zero. So my delta t function as a function of x is mx plus b, or delta t2 lx plus zero. So that is the function that I need to integrate. So, so in order to determine thermal elongations, what I'm gonna do is integrate from x equals 0 to x equals L. Alpha times delta T from 0 to L. Because alpha times delta T, that's essentially my strain. And so if I integrate strain from 0 to L, I'm going to get displacement. Remember, one of the initial definitions that we had for strain, remember we said strain was the um, derivative of displacement with respect to x. So, so if I integrate both sides, I'm getting the integral of strain dx is the displacement. That's essentially what we're doing here. So we're just integrating the strain from 0 to L. In fact, if you look at the mechanical formula, what are you doing? You're integrating the load over EA. The load over EA is the strain. So you're just integrating the strain. So if you're sort of wondering where some of these formulas came from, that's kind of what we're doing here. So <clears throat> integral from, uh, sorry. Of, let's see, so alpha, and then we have delta T2 over LX dx. And so let's take a look at what's going on inside that bracket. The alpha is a constant. The delta t2 is a constant. The L is a constant. I can factor everything out and I get alpha delta t2 over L integral from x equals 0 to x equals L of x dx. And the integral of x is just x squared over 2. So factor out the 2, and we get times L squared. Notice what's happening. The, we're going to have L's cancel, and we're going to have alpha delta T2 L over 2. Pretty straightforward. So now we can compute our delta thermal. So we have that we have 100 degrees Fahrenheit, 60 inches, all over 2. And so when you plug and chug, you get 0 0.0318 inches. So this bar is elongating because of that thermal effect, 0 0.0318 inches. So that's a pretty important value. So now remember that, okay, so that the so what we just did now, these were the thermal elongations. Now let's look at mechanical. mechanical elongations. So mechanical elongations, remember, we're going to say delta allowable is 
delta mechanical plus delta thermal. So delta mechanical is going to be delta allowable plus delta thermal. And if you remember, delta allowable was 0 0.08 inches. Sorry, oh, that's minus. Minus 0 0.0318 or 0 0.0482. Okay, so what do we know? We know that P is something. We don't know what that is. We know delta mechanical is 0 0.0482. We know L is 60 inches. We know E is 15 times 10 to the 6 um, PSI. And we know that A, because we computed that earlier, was 0 0.196 square inches. So with the mechanical loads, we don't have any constant or we don't have any variable loads or variable areas. Everything's constant. So we can just say, you know, we can just say delta is PL over EA and sort of use the same um, effect that we did before. We just multiply both sides, or the same formula we did before, multiply both sides by EA over L and say that P in this case is EA over L times delta mechanical or And after you plug and chug that a little bit, you are going to get P is, let's see, 2366.0 pounds. And so that's the amount of load. Let's go back to the beginning of the problem. What's the problem asking for? The problem is asking for determine the magnitude of P if the allowable elongation of the rod, including the temperature effect, is 0 0.08 inches. And there you go. Now, the second part is at this load, is the rod behaving elastically? So this is the second part that we want to uh, address. So let, let's look at this. So... So the way we're going to assess elastic behavior is we are going to compute the total stress, which is the mechanical stress. And the mechanical stress is going to be P over A plus any thermal stress. Now, the big question is, do we have any thermal stress? Is the thermal effects causing any stress for this problem? And the answer to that is no. Because for this problem, the bar is allowed to freely elongate. I mean, let's go back to what the problem looks like. Here we have a bar fixed on one end and it's getting heated up. It's just going to expand. There's no resistance to that expansion. So thermal stresses in this case are going to be zero. The only stress that we're going to get is P over A plus zero. So this is... Uh, 2366.0 pounds over 0 0.196 square inches, which is if you plug and chug, you get something about like 12,050 PSI. And how do we determine whether or not it's behaving elastically? Well, remember, sigma yield in this case for this problem was 15,000 PSI. So is the total stress less than the yield stress? Yes. Sigma total total is less than sigma yield. Elastic behavior. And that's it. So these are two different problems involving thermal stresses and strains. One involved resistance that you actually got thermal stresses. One involved uh, 
so there were no so there were no thermal stresses. The first problem had thermal stresses. The second one did not. And even when there were thermal stresses, the thermal stresses were really the result of mechanical resistance to that thermal load, right? So, um, so yeah, so the, the homework assignment for this only has one problem, so it's a lot uh, sh uh, shorter than the one that, you're, uh, that you just turned in. Um, and I think that if you understood these two problems, this homework should be fairly straightforward. Uh, when we come back um, next Thursday, we are going to begin the, con uh, the discussion of a new type of load. We're going to talk about torsion, so what happens if you twist an element. Um, and the reason why is that the, um, the torsion formulas are very similar. So for example, for uh, axial loads, we have the deflection as PL over EA, um, which is an applied load times the member length divided by a material property and a cross-sectional property. When you do that, you get a deformation. Well, for torsion, and the angles of twist end up being the applied load, the member length, a material property, and a cross-sectional property. And so the formulas for torsion are very much similar to the formulas for axial loads, which is why we do that next in the class. And that's why your first exam focuses on the fundamentals, axial and torsion, because axial and you're not having to do a bunch of really new different stuff. Um, but, um, but yeah, but when we come back, we're going to talk about torsion, why we restrict more often than not torsion to circular cross-sections, because there are reasons for that. Um, and we'll also finish up our torsion discussion. We'll do some indeterminacy, and we'll also do power-torque relationships. So if you have a motor with um, that's trying to deliver so much horsepower, what's, uh, what size shaft do you need to safely deliver that and whatnot? All right, that's all I have. I will see you all on Thursday.